First of all, thank you very much, uh, Anna and uh, Tomek, for giving me this opportunity. It's always an honor and pleasure to speak virtually. But uh, yeah, I, I, it's always, always a pleasure for me. So thank you very much for the invitation. So what I will be talking about today is um, a work that I started when I was still a, a PhD student in Lancaster. So just to fix some notation and terminology, um, uh, when I will say Banach space, I'll always mean a complex Banach space, but uh, not much will change if you replace it with a real in this context. And I will use a script B of X to denote the, the unit of Banach algebra of bounded linear operators on X. Uh, let me just to motivate things a bit, what I'll be talking about, uh, recall a theorem from Idelheit. I think it's a very old one from the 40s. And this theorem says that if you have uh, two Banach spaces X and Y, then they are isomorphic to each other as Banach spaces, if and only if their algebras of operators are isomorphic as Banach algebras. Now, let me just dwell a little bit on what I exactly mean by this, just to fix terminology again. So uh, Banach spaces are isomorphic for me, if and only if there is a linear homeomorphism between them. And Banach algebras are isomorphic for me if there is a homomorphic homeomorphism. So something that's not only a linear homomorphism, homeomorphism, but preserves multiplication as well. Um, so throughout the talk, if at any point I will assume that there is an isometric isomorphism, I will indicate that very clearly, or try to. So the, the research that I'm about to tell you about grew up from a, a, a very naive looking and maybe stupid look, looking question, namely that can you drop the injectivity assumption in Idelheit's theorem? So if you just assume that there is a surjective homomorphism from this guy to this guy, uh, does it hold that, that actually the, the Banach spaces X and Y are, are isomorphic to each other? And uh, let me just formulate it. So given X and Y Banach spaces, uh, suppose that there, there exists some surjective continuous algebra homomorphism from B, B of X to B of Y, uh, does it perhaps hold that this uh, psi is automatically injective? Um, and as you would expect, in general, the answer is no. But actually, already to, to find this answer, you need to have in your toolkit some um, exotic Banach spaces, so to speak. So um, there are Banach spaces uh, with the property, infinite dimensional ones, such that their algebras of operators have a character, so uh, that there exists a subjective uh, homomorphism from B of X to the complex numbers. The first such uh, examples are the James space and the Samadani space, I guess. Um, so this will obviously uh, uh, uh. not. Pardon? Any questions? No. Uh, so yeah, you just use the property that, of course, bounded linear operators on complex numbers is just a complex numbers. Examples which satisfy this. Uh, the first one was perhaps the, the James space with P equals two, and the, or shortly after was the Samadani space. So this is the continuous functions on the uh, compact ordinary interval uh, zero omega one or omega one ordinary successor. And you can also take hereditarily in the composable Banach spaces. Uh, pick your favorite one, Gauer's, Moray, Argyros, Hayden, whatever. Uh, there are a little bit more nuanced examples as well. Uh, so if you take this uh, Banach space constructed by Mankiewicz, um, which is separable and super reflexive, um, this quotients onto L infinity, and that one has a character in the complex number, so you just concatenate the two and you get a, you get a character of uh, B of XM, or you take Gower's uh, Banach space, which was used to solve the hyperplane problem, or Banach space is constructed by Matthew Tarbard. Um, you can take connected Koschmider space, then uh, continuous functions on this guy have this property, or the Motakis Puiz is Simopolu spaces. So this is just a bunch of examples. Pick your favorite one, it doesn't really matter. Um, but uh, this shows that the question, the, the answer to the question in general is no. But uh, 
fortunately for for um, some very classical Banach spaces, the the answer is yes to the question. To to demonstrate how this might work, um, let me start out with a separable Hilbert space. Then fix any non-zero Banach space Y, and assume that there exists a continuous surjective algebra homomorphism from B of H to B of Y. Then we know by Calkin's result from the 40s that the actually the lattice of close two-sided ideals of B of H is given by this very simple chain. So you have only three ideals. You have, you have the trivial one, you have the entire algebra, and the only proper non-trivial ideal, uh, closed two-sided ideal is the compact operators on, on the Hilbert space. So if you have a surjective homomorphism like this, of course, the kernel is also a closed two-sided ideal in B of H. So it must be one of these following three guys, right? So it's it's either either the trivial one or the compact operators or the um or this guy or the entire or the entire algebra. And we would like to basically exclude these two cases to conclude this one. How might we do this? Well, clearly the kernel cannot be the entire uh, B of H because I told you that Y is non-zero and, and Psi is subjective, so that's just not possible. How might we exclude the second case? So the compact operators, well, there are probably many ways of doing this, but argue via um, proof via contradiction. So assume that the kernel is the compact operators. Then you have actually this isomorphism. You have that the Calkin algebra is isomorphic as a Banach algebra to bounded linear operators on, on Y. Um, now it's fortunate to split the proof into two cases. Uh, so assume first that Y is infinite dimensional. Notice then that B of Y, though, as a Banach algebra, this is not simple. So it means that it always has a proper uh, closed or non-closed two-sided ideal. So the, the finite rank operators is always a proper non-closed uh, two-sided ideal and it's norm closure, operator norm closure, the approximable operators is a closed two-sided ideal. So, so this guy is not simple, but the left-hand side, it is simple because I just told you in the previous slide that the compact operators are the maximal ideal in B of H which is equivalent to saying that this guy is simple. So you get a contradiction. You have something simple here and something non-simple here. So this is the case when y is infinite dimensional. If uh, y is finite dimensional, then it's actually even simpler because then manifestly b of y is finite dimensional. So you have that finite dimensional guy is isomorphic to the Calkin algebra. But this is, that's, okay, that's very easy to see that this guy is not, cannot be finite dimensional. So yeah, contradiction. So we, we are left with case one, which was exactly that the kernel is trivial. That's the same as saying as our psi is injective. So, okay, we have one example and then obvious low hanging fruit worth doing immediately is that your separable Hilbert space can be replaced uh, with little c or, or um, any of the small LP spaces, any of the sequence spaces. Therefore, now P varies between one and infinity. It can be one, but for the moment, we don't allow P equal infinity. Um, a result, result from the 60s, I believe, of uh, Feldman, Goberg, and uh, Marcus is that the lattice of close two-sided ideal of P of X then is the same as in the as for the Hilbert space, separable Hilbert space case, namely this. Uh, chain. So you can run the exact same argument and then you will get the same answer. Okay, it's now probably worth making a definition. Um, so I will say that the Banach space X has uh, the shy property. If uh, for every non zero Banach space Y, every surjective algebra homomorphism from B of X to B of Y is automatically injective. Uh, shy is just a shorthand for surjective homomorphisms are injective. Um, okay, if you notice, I, I didn't demand continuity here. Why is that? Uh, 
It's not terribly important for our talk, but it's because continuity is, is always automatic for a surjective homomorphism in this case. More precisely, if you are given a and, uh, y and you have a surjective algebra homomorphism from A to B of Y, then uh, this uh, psi is automatically continuous. Um, this is a special case of a, of a deep result of Barry uh, Edward Johnson. So this is not the Banach space theorist Johnson. This is uh, uh, this is the Banach algebra is Johnson, who unfortunately passed away some time ago. But this is just a special case of, of one of his most fundamental results in Banach algebra theory. So from this is good for us for now. From now on, if we consider subjective uh, algebra homomorphisms, I, I just don't need to say the word continuous anymore because it's automatic. So why is this good for us, this property, this shy property? Well, it's useful because we can say something about the representation theory of, of uh, bounded linear operators, the algebra of bounded linear operators. Um, namely, uh, we can say about something subjective representations. So we have that if a Banach space X has this shy property, then, uh, and if you study surjective algebra homomorphisms from B of X to B of Y, then they automatically injective. So you have this isomorphism of algebras, which by Idel Heights theorem is the same as saying that X and Y are actually isomorphic to each other. So that's that's useful. So maybe it turns out that so so if you have shy property then then of your Banach space, then the surjective representations of, of your Banach algebra sort of are trivial in some sense. So what, what examples do we have so far? Um, we have C0 and the LP spaces where P is in this range. So the next uh, obvious question you might want to ask is, is what about the P equals infinity case? What can we do? What can we do there? And uh, if you recall, I was sort of cheating on the previous slides because we know by, by work of very smart people what the ideal lattice of, of uh, B of LP spaces are. Um, and it's, it's a very simple chain, so you could just go through it step by step, basically. But the case is radically different with, with um, L-infinity. It's a fairly recent result of, uh, of Bill Johnson, Gilles Pizzi, and, and Gideon Schechtman that uh, the, bounded the algebra of bounded linear operators on L-infinity has a continuum of close two-sided ideas. So I probably don't want to do the same proof as previously, where I, I try to go through them step by step, right? So it turns out that this space, L infinity, still has the shy property, but uh, we, we have to do something else. Um, now, before I get to the proof, just let me remind you of a basic sort of dichotomy we have when studying. Uh, algebra homomorphisms from B of X to B of Y. So let me fix for a moment X and Y non-zero Banach spaces and a non-zero continuous algebra homomorphism. I don't assume subjectivity at the moment. Then we have that this psi is either injective or the kernel is big enough to contain the approximable operators, the, the operator norm closure of the finite rank operators. That's because that's the minimal close two-sided ideal. So this is just, let's keep in mind for a moment. And uh, I'm going to show to you uh, quickly that uh, we can say something slightly more when psi is in addition subjective. Uh, I have to make a quick definition here. I have to tell you what an inessential operator is. Um, so a bounded linear operator is an inessential operator if um, Ix minus st is a fed home operator for every s bounded linear operator, or in other words, t is inessential if and only if uh, the dimension of the kernel of this operator is finite dimensional and the co-dimension of the range of this operator is finite dimensional. And uh, it's it turns out it's not too hard to see that that uh, 
inessential the set of inessential operators is a proper close to sided ideal of BOX whenever you have a, a finite infinite dimensional Banach space X. We might want to know where this how big is this ideal or how small it is. And in of course, as well known, uh, you just look at the work of Tomek or Anna, you see that the, the ideal lattice of of uh, of um, bounded linear operators on Banach spaces can be very, very complicated. But something you can always say, some usually very little, but it turns out that you always have this chain. So you always have, of course, a trivial ideal, which is properly contained in the approximable operators. Uh, this is contained in a compact operators. It might, this may or may not be a proper inclusion. They might coincide. Compact operators are always contained in the strictly singulars. Again, these can coincide. And strictly singulars are contained in the inessential operators, may or may not be proper. And this is always properly contained in, in B of X. There might still be other ideas here though, or and there can be various other ideas which are incomparable with these ones, but this is always a sub, this is always a sublattice of the possibly very complicated lattice of close two-sided ideas of BOX. Um, okay, this is just a digression here. That was a question of, uh, I don't exactly know, maybe even Pete's, Peach, uh, Peach's question was that whether uh, this operator ideal, um, script E, is this is this the largest uh, proper closed operator ideal? And it turns out that it's, this is not not the case. This was shown by Valenta Ferenczi quite recently. So with these things in mind, let me just uh, uh, flesh out here a little dichotomy result that we will uh, use later. So you can think about this as an analogy of the, the the trivial fact which I told you previously that either if you have a, if you have a continuous algebra homomorphism, then its kernel is either trivial or or contains the approximables. Uh, if you additionally suppose that this is subjective, then you can say something more than either this psi is injective or it contains the inessential operators. Of course, this is not utterly useful when, when all these ideas here coincide. This is not telling you really anything more than what you have, but sometimes you can get lucky. Um, so this time is actually sufficient to prove uh, that L infinity has um, the shy property. And also the same proof works to show that this arbitrary distortable Banach space constructed by Schlumprecht, this also has the shy property. Um, something that I ought to mention here is that um, sometimes when you study the shy property, uh, it's sufficient to, to restrict your attention to, to when looking at the target spaces y, it's sufficient to restrict your attention to infinite dimensional y's. Uh, in particular, if uh, your Banach space S x has the property that it contains a complemented copy, oh, sorry, a complemented subspace of, uh, which is isomorphic to the square of x, then x has the shy property if and only if just put inside the definition of shy property here, but uh, you only need to look at infinite dimensional y's here. So this is just that you don't need to consider the finite dimensional y's really. Uh, this is due to the fact that when x has this property that it uh, uh, contains a complemented subspace, which is isomorphic to x squared, p of x cannot have uh, two-sided ideals, but proper two-sided ideals, of course. So let's see that uh, L infinity and Schlumberg space have the shy property. So yeah, just take uh, Y infinite dimensional and take a surjective algebra homomorphism. Um, both Schlumberg space and of course L infinity has this property that they are isomorphic to their squares. So that's why I can restrict to y infinite dimensional. And assume for a moment that this psi is not injective. Then because of this dichotomy result, uh, I 
told you previously, we know that the inessential operators are, are uh, contained in the kernel of Psi. And now we will basically split, split the proof. Let's first consider the case where X is L infinity. I'm going to use now a very nice observation of Niels Lawson and Rick Loy uh, from 2004 or three, where they showed that the inessential operators, the ideal of inessential operators is the unique maximal ideal in, in uh, B of X. Actually, the inessential operators in this case coincide with the weakly compacts, with the operators with separable range, with the strictly singulars. But anyways, the point is that this is the unique maximal ideal. Um, so therefore, we must have, because the kernel already contains the inessentials, we must have that they actually coincide. Uh, how about the Schlumprecht space case? So Schlumprecht space is complementably minimal. I mean, this audience knows what complementably minimal is, but here you can read the definition if you don't know. Uh, and it turns out, it, it's a theorem of Wittli or observation of Wittli that uh, the strictly singular operators is the unique maximal ideal in uh, B of X whenever X is complementarily minimal. So with Schlumpeck space, we immediately have that the strictly singulars coincide with the inessentials, which must then coincide with uh, the kernel of Psi. So, in both cases, we have that the kernel of Psi is actually the inessential operators. So we have this isomorphism of Banach algebras. We have that B of X mod inessential operators is isomorphic to B of Y. And now we just want to use a very similar argu argument that in our toy example for the separable Hilbert space case. So notice that on the left-hand side, we, we quotienting out with a maximal ideal. So this is the unique maximal ideal in both cases, as it we have it from Whitley's and uh, Lauchs and Lois results. So we have a simple algebra here, but here this algebra is not simple again because y is infinite dimensional. So we always have a proper two-sided ideal, and this is a contradiction. So we actually must have that this psi is injective. Okay, so we settled shy property for some classical Banach spaces, and uh, we also have shy for a more exotic one, Schlumpert space, but same argument. Um, let's try to look at some other classical looking Banach spaces now again. Um, namely, I would like to consider uh, the C0 and L1 sum of uh, finite dimensional. Um, Hilbert spaces where the dimension is increasing. Um, it's actually essential. So you might be asking, okay, why the C0 and L1 sum? And that's because I would like to say, I would like to use results about the ideal lattice of bounded linear operators on these Banach spaces. And to my knowledge, they are only, the results I need are only known for the C0 and L1 case. Uh, and the other direction where you, we might would like to go is consider the non-separable counterparts of our uh, C0 and LP spaces. So um, I owe you a bit of explanation what I mean by this. Uh, this L infinity C lambda is um, the, the collection of those elements from uh, L infinity lambda, where lambda is some uh, cardinal number, where the support uh, of the elements is countable. Uh, this is actually, it turns out that this is a non-unital sub C star algebra of the commutative C star algebra L infinity uh, lambda. And it actually turns out you can use Galfon duality and some standard facts about uh, this guy that it turns out that this L infinity C lambda is actually a CK space. Um, this is an observation of uh, Bill Johnson uh, and, and uh, Gideon Schechtman. So uh, just to keep in mind that the, the goal is that for now that I would like to show that these Banach spaces have the shy property and I'm gonna set up some uh, machinery 
for that on the following slides. So let me define yet another ideal, which is very useful for our purposes, but it's a very well known one, uh, so not to worry. So let's look at the set of operators of the form ST, where uh, T is an operator from some Banach space X to W, and S is an operator from W to X, and consider the closed linear span of this set. Then it turns out that these guys are close to sided ideal in B of X, and it's usually referred to as the ideal of operators that approximately factor through W, or just the ideal of operators that factor through W, depends on the terminology. But. Um, a very convenient uh, thing that we have is that if uh, X has a complemented subspace, which is isomorphic to W, and uh, P is an idempotent, which uh, has range isomorphic to W, that this ideal here is actually exactly the I close two-sided ideal generated by the, the idempotent P. This is this is pretty much the only property we, we will use about this this idea later on. Um, so uh, let me now tell you a result that we did with Tomac. Uh, so if X is a Banach space, so suppose we have a Banach space X which has a complemented subspace W such that W already has the shy property. Uh, now. Suppose a Banach space Y is given and a surjective algebra homomorphism from B of X to B of Y, then uh, Psi is either injective or uh, the ideal of operators approximately factoring through W is contained in the kernel of Psi. So this is another dichotomy result. So we had so far, basically, this is the second dichotomy result. We had the zeroth version, which was just talking about general, uh, Algebra continuous algebra homomorphism. That was the one about surjective algebra homomorphism, where the conclusion was that the inessentials are contained here, or psi is injective. And now we have this one, which again says that uh, if y is a complemented subspace of X, such that sorry, W is a complemented subspace of of y. What am I saying? So if W is a complemented subspace of X and W already has the shy property, then we have this dichotomy. Either any uh, surjective algebra homomorphism is already injective or, or it's so big, the kernel is so big that it contains the um, operators which approximately factor through W. How do we prove a result like this? Um, so let's take uh, an idempotent, which has uh, range W, and suppose again towards a contradiction that Psi is, so suppose that Psi is not uh, injective. Um, notice first that to, to show the claim, to show that then um, uh, Psi has so big kernel that it contains that ideal, then it's actually enough to see that P, P itself is contained in the kernel. Indeed, if this holds, then as I told you before, this uh, the ideal of operator operators approximately factoring through W is nothing but the ideal uh, generated by P. So if P is in the kernel, then of course the ideal it generates will also be in the kernel because this is an ideal, a close one. So all we need to show is that P is contained in the kernel and now assume towards a contradiction that it's not. Now, if you look at uh, Psi P, then of course, because uh, Psi is a surjective algebra homomorphism, then Psi P is also an idempotent. So we can, def so the range will be, this guy will be automatically closed. So this is, if we define Z to be the range, is a non-zero uh, and complemented subspace of Y. It's very important that this is non-zero. Uh, we will use uh, the shy property of W, but recall that in the definition of shy property, uh, it was essential that the target spaces are non-zero. Otherwise, it just don't, doesn't make sense. So now we consider a map which goes from bounded linear operators on this complemented subspace W into bounded linear operators on, on, on Z. 
Uh, and basically we do is this the following way. So T is an operator on, on uh, W. We compose T from both sides with P, but of course we consider uh, now P as with range in W, we can do that. And here we restrict P to the range of W. So this makes perfect sense. Then we have a, an operator. This is now an operator on X. Uh, so we can take the Psi of this guy, but this lands in B of Y, but uh, we can restrict then again to Z. And it turns out that if you restrict to Z, then the range of this will of course be also in Z. So this is a perfectly well-defined uh, map. Um, it is also an algebra homomorphism. Um, that's, I'm not going to show that, but that's very easy to see. And something that's a little bit less obvious that this is uh, surjective. Now, we would like to use shy property of W. So again, crucially, Z is a non-zero Banach space by the indirect assumption. Uh, therefore, we can use shy property of W, and it follows that this surjective algebra homomorphism is automatically injective. Okay, that's good. Let's let's keep this in mind. And now, let me do something that it's a little pre-calculation we need. So now, let me just take an arbitrary bounded linear operator on X, which happens to be in the kernel of our original map uh, psi then I can compose this A with uh, P from both sides. And again, I'm restricting in a way that uh, this will be an operator on uh, W, on the complemented subspace W. So I can take uh, the theta of, of, of uh, this guy because that was defined from B of Z. What it does by definition is composes from the other side with the P's. And then at the end, we restrict. But these are just the idempotents anyway. And now I would like to use the size uh, multiplicative. So I split this, or I factor this product like this. But A was from the kernel of psi, so this is actually 0. OK, great. What does this say? Well, we know that psi is injective. Sorry, we know that the theta is injective. So we conclude that this operator must be the zero operator, which is equivalent to saying that this corner of A, so P, A, P, this is, this is zero. Uh, we will apply this in just a very specific situation, actually. Uh, let me choose a, a norm one vector in the range of P, so in, in, in W. And with Hanbanach, let me take uh, a norm one functional in the dual of X, such that the psi evaluates as one, psi evaluates as, as uh, one at X. Now, psi was not injective. Um, so we have that this rank one operator, X tensor uh, psi, this is uh, of course contained because it's, it's rank one, so it's, and psi is non-injective, and so the finite rank operators are contained in the kernel of psi. Uh, so we must have, by this calculation that I did before, just replace A with this rank one operator, that uh, if I compose this rank one operator with P from both sides, then this must be zero. Okay, so in particular, if I apply this zero operator to X, it must be still zero, but, I just write down what this tensor product means here, and I use that x was from the range of p. So we end up that with the fact that x is zero, but that's a contradiction. X was non one. So we arrived at a contradiction which says that p is in the kernel of psi. So therefore, the as I said before, the ideal it generates must be also in the in the contained in the kernel of psi, and that's exactly what we wanted to show. Okay, cool. Now we would like to see how we could apply this to some uh, examples. So the examples I'm going to apply this to is, is uh, these type of Banach spaces first. So I claim that the Y sum of L to Ns where N is increasing and uh, Y is C0 L1, this has the, the shy property. What 
but this proof crucially depends on is some really nice results of uh, Nieslaus and Rikloy, Charles Reed, and uh, uh, Nieslaus and Thomas Schlumprecht and Andrea Jacques. Namely, namely, they did that. They classified the, the close two sided ideas of B of X, where um, X is one of these guys. They actually, the lattice of closed two-sided ideas looks like this. It's a chain consisting of, uh, of four elements. You have exactly four ideas. You have the zero, you have the trivial one, you have the compact operators. You have the ideal of operators approximately factoring through Y and you have the whole thing. So now what you want to know, what you want to do is just apply uh, the dichotomy lemma I told you about told you about to to this, and there's really nothing to do here. Uh, we've set up everything well. Of course, this Banach space is isomorphic to its square torch, so we can actually apply the dichotomy lemma. That's the only thing to know, and we already already noticed that C zero and L one have the shy property, so we're done. And there is another, so you might wonder why did I not I put Tomek here? I think we don't mention this in our paper. This was, this result is actually in my previous paper, but I gave a different proof there. What I did is I showed that the Kalkin algebra of these Banach spaces does not have minimal idempotence, and that's a somewhat different argument than, than this, this nice elegant one we have here with Tomek. So we, I would like to go now to, to the, the transfinite sequence spaces uh, direction. And uh, for, uh, first, let me recall again that C0 and LP, the classical ones, the separable ones, have the shy property, and also L infinity has the shy property. Um, I already did in a previous paper uh, the L2 case for long sequence spaces. So all non-separable uh, Banach spaces, in fact, uh, have the shy property. That's the same as saying that L2 of any infinite cardinal uh, lambda has the shy property. Uh, the proof I gave there used uh, spectral theory and the facts that you can lift idempotence from these type of quotient C-star algebras back into to bounded linear operators on uh, B of L2 lambda, wherever you can quotient with any, any uh, close two-sided ideal. It turns out that uh, because of this lifting property, um, that these quotients actually don't have any minimal idempotence. And therefore, when you try to do again, try to prove again shy property of these guys, and you try to run the usual proof, and and you end up with an isomorphism like this in your indirect argument, then you end up with an isomorphism of this form, where this guy uh, does not have any minimal idempotence. The left hand side, but the right hand side does. In fact, uh, minimal idempotence in in B of Y are just the, the rank one ones, the rank one idempotence. So um, I'm not going to go into this because I will tell you about the result which we did together with Tomek, namely that for any infinite cardinal lambda, C0 lambda, LP of lambda, and L infinity C of lambda, uh, the, all these Banach spaces have the shy property. Here P ranges between 1 and infinity. It can be 1, but it cannot be uh, infinity. So this subsumes uh, my previous result, of course, but the proof is very, very different. Um, I'll have to tell you some ingredients. Uh, first, uh, I have to, I should tell you what a generalization of the strictly singular operators. These are the so-called Y stringular, Y singular operators, I'm sorry. So if X and Y are Banach spaces, then you define this subset of b of x uh, the following way well an operator does not belong to this subset if and only if you can find uh, a closed subspace w of x which is isomorphic to uh, y such that uh, when you restrict t to this subspace w this is bounded below 
Um, so that's the same as saying that T does belong to this subset if and only if there is no um, copy of uh, Y in X uh, on which um, your T, if you restrict to it, is bounded below. This, this set is called, usually it's referred to as the, as the set of Y singular oper operators. Uh, it's a bit, so one has to be a bit careful here because uh, it, this, this set has some nice, nice properties, but in general, it's not an ideal. So this set, this Y singular, this operator increases in the sense that if uh, Y is contained in Z, then Y singular operators are also uh, Z singular operators. It is, uh, it looks like an ideal in the sense that if you have something from, from this set and you have a bounded linear operator, then the products of this form um, belong to the set, that's fine. But in general, this, this set need not be closed under addition. Uh, so you cannot say in general that this guy is an ideal. However, something that's uh, important for us that in some cases we know that this is uh, actually an ideal. Um, let me just first restrict my attention to the X singular operators on X. If we know that uh, uh, X is complementably homogeneous as a Banach space, and this guy is closed under addition, then actually it turns out that the X singular operators is the unique maximal ideal in, in B of X. This is probably folk result, but with Tomek we included it in our paper. So this is just a reminder that we already encountered complementably minimal Banach spaces, complementably homogeneous uh, Banach spaces are sort of a natural generalization of those in a sense that uh, X is complementably homogeneous uh, whenever you have a subspace of X, Y, which is isomorphic to X, then you can find a further subspace Z, which is contained in Y, such that Z is actually complemented in X and isomorphic to X. Uh, of course, all these Banach spaces that I'm going to consider in the following, so C0 of lambda, L infinity C of lambda, and LP of lambda, these are all complementably homogeneous. Um, now, I, some other ingredients I will need uh, for the proof of this result. Uh, I have to make some uh, remarks that ease notation. So from now on, E lambda, uh, subscript lambda will just denote one of these Banach spaces. And here is a beautiful theorem of, of Bill Johnson and uh, Tomek and uh, Gideon Schechtman. They, in fact, classified closed two-sided ideals of, of uh, these guys. Um, well, if this one, just the lattice from, from above the weakly compact operators, but what I'm going to need is actually just this result, uh, that the set of uh, E kappa uh, singular operators on, on E lambda is a closed non-zero proper two-sided ideal whenever uh, kappa is an infinite cardinal uh, below lambda. So in particular, um, by the previous bullet points, I told you the E lambda singular operators on, on, on E lambda is, is uh, the unique maximal ideal. Um, maybe just so there's no confusion. So uh, if E lambda here, for example, means C0 of lambda, then E kappa means C0 of kappa. So, uh, E, the E is always referred to the same type of Banach space. So there is no, we don't, we don't consider C0 singular operators on, on, on LP spaces or something like that. Another uh, result which we will be using uh, is also that due to the same three guys is that uh, if we have uncountable cardinals, uh, lambda and, and kappa, and kappa is smaller than uh, smaller than equal than lambda, and k is not a successor of any cardinal number, then we may write the the e kappa singular operators as the closure of the increasing union of uh, the e alpha 
singular operators and alpha here just uh, runs up until uh, copper, not including copper. So uh, the, the last bit, what we will need for the proof is uh, this result, which um, with Tomek, we did it for the C0 and the LP case, and uh, but the L infinity C case was already done by, by uh, Bill Tomek and Gideon. So this result says that if lambda and kappa are infinite cardinals, and uh, you have a bounded linear operator, which is not E kappa singular, then actually the E kappa successor singular operators are contained in the closed two-sided ideal generated by T. Uh, just a word of caution. So, so I'm talking about cardinals here. So kappa plus, of course, means cardinal successor, just that there's no confusion um, arising here. So if, if T is sort of not an E kappa singular operator, then, then we have this interesting result that uh, then the ideal it generates, this operator T must be big enough to contain actually all the uh, E kappa uh, successor singular operators. So this is something that we will use. So I just outlined the strategy, what we will do here. Uh, so I would like to prove that E lambda uh, has the shy property. What we will do is actually transfinite induction in these cardinals. Use these above, these, these three theorems I or facts uh, I told you, and the second dichotomy result. Um, yeah, uh, let me just get to it actually. So here goes the proof. So it's transfinite induction, as I told you. So let lambda be some fixed infinite cardinal. And suppose that we already know that uh, E kappa has the shy property for every kappa cardinal, which is uh, strictly below lambda. Assume towards a contradiction that we can find some infinite dimensional Banach space Y, and we can find a subjective algebra homomorphism from B of, uh, E lambda to B of Y, which is not injective. Um, of course, these E kappas are isomorphic to complemented subspaces of E lambda, so we may take an idempotent operator on E lambda with range being isomorphic to E kappa. Now, clearly, the, just by the very definition, this this uh, this idempotent operator does not belong to the uh, ideal of uh, kappa singular operators. So, by this theorem, I this last bullet point I, I showed you above, we actually have that the the ideal um, p generates, which just coincides with the uh, ideal of operators uh, factoring th uh, through E kappa, this already contains the E uh, kappa successor singular operators. But uh, by the hypothesis, we know that this guy has the shy property. So we can use the second dichotomy result. And we actually conclude that besides this, we also have that this uh, ideal, the e kappa, the, the operators which approximately factor through e kappa are contained in the kernel. Okay. And uh, now I actually want to prove that this nice containment here implies that the e lambda uh, singular operators, which is the maximal ideal, is contained in the kernel. Um, now we sort of, it's good to split the proof into three cases. Now, as usual, with transfinite induction, when lambda is just omega, when lambda is a successor cardinal, and when lambda is some uncountable uh, cardinal and not uh, a successor cardinal. So if lambda is just omega, then uh, E lambda is just C0 or LP. And then basically we've already done this. The, the first dichotomy results already, already told, tell you that uh, inessential operators are contained in the kernel, but the inessential operators happen to be exactly the, uh, the unique maximal ideal we already have. So we're done with that. Um, when lambda is a successor, so when lambda is some kappa successor for some kappa, 
then we have this containment clearly from the above. And lastly, uh, assume now that uh, lambda is uncountable and not a successor of any cardinal. Then we clearly have, so this was what we concluded on the previous slide. Of course, I told you that uh, then, of course, the E kappa singular operators are contained in the E kappa successor singular operators. So we actually have this containment. And this holds for any E kappa strictly less than lambda. And now, therefore, I can, of course, take the union and the closure of the union. And because this the kernel is closed, this will still be contained here. But on the on the this last result of of um, Bill and Tomek and Gideon that I told you about says that this union and closure this is exactly the unique maximal ideal. So we conclude what we wanted. So it turns out that because again using that this is the maximal ideal, we have that then this containment actually must be an equality. So we have that the kernel of our psi must be exactly the E lambda singular operators. Usual trick to finish off the proof. Um, we have this isomorphism of Banach algebras, quotienting with a maximal idea here on the left hand side. So we have a simple guy here. We have a non simple guy here because y is infinite dimensional. We arrived at a contradiction. We now know that uh, psi, is, uh, uh, psi is a subjective algebra homomorphism, which is automatically injected. Some some remarks. Um, I, I haven't told you anything about uh, capital LP spaces on zero one. So it turns out that uh, when when P is in the reflexive range, then then all these guys have the shy property. This is um, unpublished result. To my knowledge, so far it's not even on on the archive uh, of Bill Johnson, Chris Phillips, and Gideon Schachtman. Uh, note that the, to my knowledge, the p equals one case is still open. The p equals infinity case is of course done, but that's just capital L p capital L infinity is the same as small l infinity, so not much to do there. Um, they also the same three guys also considered some very non-classical complemented subspaces of L p, for example, this Rosenthal, these xp Rosenthal spaces. These also have the shy property, it turns out. Um, another shy properties is doesn't have too many good hereditary properties, but something that it has actually, that if you have uh, some finite set of uh, Banach spaces all which have the shy property, then if you take any finite sum of them, then this also has the shy property. Uh, this is useful because, for example, if you take uh, 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 for example, sums of LP and LQ, where P is not Q, or C0 and L, LP, then, then you can immediately say that, oh, these guys also have the shy property. But uh, if you would try to do this sort of just by hand, so, you know, step by step looking at the ideals, that might not be a good strategy because uh, there, are, there's ample, there are ample results of Freeman and Schlumprecht and Jacques, which show that bounded linear operators on, on these guys have a very, very complicated uh, ideal lattice. So not, not at all as simple and nice and easy as, as these, uh, the factors thereof. So um, if one would maybe naturally ask if, if is shy a three space property? And, and it turns out it's not. But we did this with Tomek, but I observed this with Tomek, but this actually relies on work of uh, very recent work of, of Piotr Koschmider and, and Niels Lausen. So the result I just briefly recall here is that they, uh, Piotr and Niels showed that there exists an uncountable almost disjoint family, uh, such that if you consider the, the uh, corresponding Isbam roof car space um, K, then bounded linear operators on uh, this CK space has a character. So that means that it cannot have the shy property. C0 of K cannot have the shy property because there is a, a surjective non-injective algebra homomorphism manifestly into the complex numbers. 
And uh, something that follows immediately from their construction is that you can realize this space as a twisted sum of, of C0 and uh, C0 on the continuum. And we determined already that these two guys have the shy property. Uh, that was the previous result I told you about, and this was in the very beginning. But this guy does not have the shy property, so so you have so this is so shy property is not a three space property, not a, a three space property. But let me now go so some other remarks that so far I, I told you about Banach spaces which have this shy property, and I told you some some examples of of uh, Banach spaces which don't. But all the examples I told you, which don't have the shy property, were trivial. I mean, in the sense, uh, all I did is 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 use the fact that uh, so far that you have Banach spaces X such that there exists a character from B of X to the complex numbers or or bound linear operators on the complex numbers as the same. Of course, you can glue this sort of trivially together, and you can always quotient on on some finite dimensional Banach algebra. But the question naturally arises: if if you can you can you quotient into something infinite dimensional? So let me just phrase let, let me just phrase this properly. It turns out that if you have a separable reflexive Banach space, then you can always okay. find a Banach space x y such that there exists a surjective non-injective algebra homomorphism from this uh, b of x y to b of y. Um, this will actually be the Banach space that, that implements your, your implements what you want. Uh, so this is a complemented subspace of uh, the continuous functions on the ordinary interval 0, omega, 1 with values in y. Uh, namely, that complemented subspace where all the functions vanish at omega one. Again, the, the most important fact I will use is a beautiful result of um, Kania, Koschmider, and, and Lausen, uh, which says the following: it it describes uh, the character on on uh, the algebra of operators on this Banach space C zero of the a half open ordinary interval zero omega one. Namely, the result says that if you have a bounded linear operator on this Banach space, then you can always find a unique scalar phi t and a closed unbounded subset of this half open ordinary interval such that t sort of behaves like a multiplication on if you restrict your attention to this closed unbounded subset of, of your ordinary interval. So I will say, I'll not say closed and unbounded anymore, I'll just say club subset. So it turns out that the result immediately implies that this uh, map, which assigns to your operator this unique scalar, this is actually uh, a character. In other words, this is a, a unit preserving continuous surjective algebra homomorphism from bounded linear operators to the complex numbers. Um, a few remarks are in order. So, uh, okay, so one, one is obvious that this club subset that you have here, that's never unique. So that's, uh, that's obvious. Um, the scalar is unique. The club subset is of course never unique. Uh, this, this character that their theorem gives, this is sometimes called, or, or even they call it, I think, in their paper, uh, aspach benjamini character, because um, these guys, Aspach and Benjamini, have a paper where they mention that there exists a homomorphism like this, but I, uh, I'm not sure how, if there is a, well, there is a proof of that fact, but I think it's, Piotr and Tomek and Nils proof is somewhat sort of di more digestible. The, the, the kernel of this, um, of this character is uh, sometimes called the Loewillis ideal. 
Uh, of course, this is a one codimensional, therefore maximal ideal. Um, actually, uh, Tomek and Niels studied the, the, the lattice of closed two sided ideals in this guy. Um, and something I just would like to mention that this is just, a, they give a very nice uh, partial characterization of, of, of uh, the lattice. Um, but for example, what we, we know and we will use, I think, in the following is that the inessential operators coincide with the compact operators, but both these guys are, are properly contained in the, in the Loewillis ideal, so that the kernel of the character we have. So uh, before I get to the proof, uh, let me just say some uh, remarks uh, uh, about this Banach space we're going to use. So if you think about continuous functions on the closed ordinal, compact ordinary interval 0, omega 1 with values in Y, this Banach space is isometrically isomorphic to the injective tensor product of continuous functions with scalar values on 0, omega 1, tensor with, with y. Uh, basically, the identification goes, what, what we will use from this is just that you may identify, you may think of, of elements of these guys either as functions from, from um, from the interval zero omega one to the complex numbers or or this uh, rank one. Uh, so I identify these with the rank one vectors f tens or x. Uh, this was this is just a record that this was my definition of the object in the theorem that I will use. So x capital X y for y some fixed uh, Banach space will just stand for. The, the subset of, of those functions in uh, from the continuous functions uh, which vanish at zero. Um, actually, it's not very hard to see that that two functionals on on this guy are equal to each other if and only if um, they agree when you test them on elementary functions of the form f tensor or x, but note that here f is not, the f's, the functions are enough uh, to take from the functions which vanish, at inf which vanish at omega one, you don't need to consider them on the entire uh, space C. So it's enough to test them on this complemented subspace. Turns out, actually, from all these above that I, I told you, that you may very well think about x, y uh, as the injective tensor product of, of this Banach space continuous functions vanishing at uh, omega 1, injective tensor product with, uh, with y. We will not, this is really just for, for um, this is not really as very essential to the proof, but it's, it's convenient to think about it sometimes like that. Something I will also heavily feature is, is uh, we, will we will need what the dual space of, of these guys. Well, of course, this is scattered, this, this topological space. So by Rudin's result, we know that this uh, CK space, the dual of this CK space will be isometric or isomorphic to summable sequences on omega-1 successor. Here, successor is ordinal uh, successor. Um, and the duality is given by just this bracket, this obvious one. You can, th if you want, you can think about uh, these delta alphas for some alpha ordinal numbers as, as, as the Dirac measures, or you can think about that them as functionals evaluating at alpha. It's, it's going to be the same thing because of this representation. Okay, so uh, this the Samadani space, this uh, continuous functions on zero omega one, this has the approximation property. Uh, and it's dual, it has the Radon Nicodim property because by, it's isometrically isomorphic to L1 of something by Rudin's result. We only need this to conclude that actually we can have a nice description of the dual space of, of this guy. So it's Again, continuous functions on 
the compact ordinary interval with y using y, the dual space can be thought of as the dual space of this injective tensor product. This is from the previous slide. Uh, here is where I'm using the approximation property and the rather Nikodim property. It turns out that you can sort of bring, bring the star inside because they have these nice properties. So uh, this will be isometrically isomorphic to the projective tensor product of the dual of the continuous functions and the dual of uh, y. But we know that this is R1. And it turns out that uh, that's also very well known that L1 of something projective tensor product some Banach space is just L1 of uh, functions from uh, L1 of of, um, of this set with values in in, in uh, y star. So you can think many ways about elements in the dual of, of this guy, however you find it uh, convenient. Okay, so actually now I will say something about the proof of of uh, of the theorem. I'll probably skip a lot of details because I think I included way too much, but let's see. So let me fix uh, a bounded linear operator on this on this uh, Banach space x y. Um, uh, fix x and fix a functional. Then we would like to define a map in the following way. So we fix a function for now. And what, what do we do? So recall that uh, F tensor X, this is an element of the injective tensor product, or if you like, uh, it's an element of, um, of uh, continuous functions of zero omega one with uh, uh, values in Y. Then we have S that acts on this space because this uh, vanishes at omega one. So S can act on this guy uh, and it, Lens still in x y okay so we can evaluate this at alpha sure and then we this this will be an element of y this guy so we can uh, evaluate this at the functional uh, psi okay so we have a map from the ordinary interval into the complex numbers so here s here, what we had fixed is the operator, uh, a vector, a functional, and a function. Okay, so this is actually this. This is a continuous map, and that's also easy to see that it uh, vanishes at omega one. So we actually have that this uh, S X psi f. This is a, a continuous function on zero omega one vanishing at omega one. So we can define a map, which now goes from this Banach space, which acts on the Banach space. This depends on X and Psi still. So S, X and Psi is still fixed. And what it does is just assigns to F this guy. Um, this is linear, that's easy to check. And it also obeys this bound, this trivial bound, okay. And what we would like to do now is apply this beautiful theorem of Piot, Tomek, and, and Niels, uh, namely we apply to the, this operator. So that gives us uh, a club subset. This depends on X psi and S, I just didn't write down S. This gives a club subset of the half open ordinary interval such that uh, S X psi X as a multiplication on this club subset. I just wrote down the dual form here, but so you don't need to write functions, but it's the same. Okay. Uh, we also note, so note that this psi sx, sorry, phi sx psi, this is a scalar, this is just a number, but this number arises from, uh, from a character on, on the Banach space. So we actually have that this bound is satisfied because every character is of norm one always. So we will define with the help of this a map on the Cartesian product of uh, y uh, and y star, uh, the dual of y. 
So this maps a pair x psi into this number. Again, it's this bound is satisfied. That's cool. And what we would like to do now is to show that this map is actually bilinear. Um, I will not do this. You can check it. You have to use the properties of, of um, that the tensor product is linear in the first variable, so forth. Um, this is just a simple calculation. But actually, if you do this, it turns out that uh, your, your map, this theta tilde s, this will be linear in the first variable. With a similar argument, you can show that it's linear in the second variable. So what we ended up with, that we have a bounded bilinear form on the Cartesian product y uh, times uh, dual of y. Now, uh, let me denote the, the, the isometric embedding, the canonical isometric embedding from y to y uh, by dual by kappa y. Uh, and recall that we assume that uh, y is reflexive. So I may very well consider the inverse of this map. And I will define now uh, a map from y to y with the help of this, uh, sorry, with the help of this uh, psi tilde s. And how, how do we do this? So we assign to uh, an element x of y, this guy, what does this do? So the theta tilde s was a bilinear form. So if the first variable is fixed, then this is just a, a linear map from um, y dual into the complex numbers. So this is actually an element of the bi dual of y. So we can pull this back into y. Cool. Uh, it will satisfy, obviously, this norm condition. And it turns out that if you avoid, you do this evaluation of uh, theta s x uh, psi, then this is nothing else but the uh, phi of the this operator s x psi. And this works for every x and every psi. Um, so now we can finally define our desired map. So. Let theta be uh, a map from b of x, y to b of y, which assigns to an operator s, this theta s that we previously obtained. Basically, this was the trivial part of the proof. This was, this was the, the, we now have to show that this guy is a surjective algebra homomorphism. So far, that this is just some well-defined map. And here is where we need, here is where we will heavily rely on the fact that we assumed that uh, y was uh, separable and reflexive. So of course, if y is separable and reflexive, then, then the dual must be separable as well. So let me just take some uh, countable dense subsets of these guys, q and r, say. Um, and let me fix an operator for now on, on uh, x, y, some vector from this dense subset and some functional from this dense subset. Uh, Again, as above, we're using the the Kanya Koshmider Lausen theorem to extract a, a club subset of the half open ordinary interval, which depends on our choice of s, x, and and psi, but it will satisfy this this property. And this is this is the same so. What I just rewrote this equation here in the form. I'm just using the duality formulas. Uh, just I just rewrite this equation this way. Um, I use what the definition of Sx psi was. Um, now, yes, yes, yes. Sorry, this is where I uh, apologies. This was obviously not using this. This is just this is an obvious equation here. This is where I'm using the definition of Sx psi, and this is where I'm using this property that I obtained from, from, from the theorem. I'm using the definition of the theta here. And lastly, this is just a trivial equation again. This is just using the fact that you may think about continuous functions on uh, the ordinary interval with values in, in y as, as a tensor 
uh, for act of two Banach spaces. Um, so we have an equation now which holds or for all uh, continuous functions and all ordinals which belong to this club subset, which has dependence on, on too many things. But here is here is the here is the idea. So club subsets are nice; they behave very well on their on their uh, countable intersections. So if I, I take countable intersections of of club subsets, the result is still a club subset. So what I'll do now is what I obtained from the theorem: club subsets. I take the intersection of all those guys, where these parameters x and uh, psi run through these dense countable subsets of, of y and y star. So here I end up with a club subset that only depends now on my operator s. So actually what we have that this uh, equation that I had on the previous slide, this holds for now for all alpha uh, in this uh, club subset, depending only on the operator and nothing else. And this equation holds for, for all f's, all alpha's in the club subset, and all x's in the dense subset, and all psi's in the dense subset. So that's, that's, that's OK. Now, what, what I actually would like to show that uh, this equality, this extends on, on the entire this equality holds when I when I replace Q with uh, Y and uh, R with with Y star. So that probably many ways of doing this, but uh, it's convenient perhaps to do it this way. So uh, you define uh, maps G and H from from this metric space from from uh, from Y times Y star to the complex numbers the following way. So your function defend, depends on the operator S from an alpha co corresponding to the club subset from the club subset and uh, for a function, what it does it just assigns to a pair, uh, basically the left hand side of this equation and the function H assigns to the right hand side of this, this equation. And uh, so basically then you can rewrite this as this equation, but this holds for uh, pairs from this dense subset. Now you can easily check that these functions are actually continuous between the metric spaces. And then you just use the fact that this is a dense subset of uh, uh, y times y star, y times uh, y dual. So the equation must hold on the entire uh, metric space. It's really just thinking about them as metric spaces. So just plug back the definition of G and H. And then what you actually obtain at the end that uh, for any fixed operator, you can find a club subset depending on the operator such that this equation holds whenever you take uh, alphas from the club subset, any continuous function, any vector, and any uh, functional. So this is good. We are now we are now in game. Uh, I will use I had several slides before that I told you that to show that this one, and this one are the same. It's enough to to test them against uh, vectors of this form. That's exactly what I'm doing here. So this is equivalent to saying that this equation holds now. Um, basically, there's a bit of work first to do that. There's the the operator that you have here is uh, uniquely determined by this equation. That's not, not immediately obvious, but perhaps I will actually skip that. That's not very interesting, but uh, yeah, I, I'll skip that. I think that's not totally important. But let me show that this theta is actually an algebra homomorphism. So just the multiplicativity actually because that's a bit that's uh, interesting so let me fix s and t bounded linear operators and let me extract club subsets d d of d d t d s and d t s 
such that this equation one, which I had several slides before this one holds. Yeah. So of course, let me take an ordinal from the intersection of these club subsets. Again, this is never empty, this intersection, because it must be a club subset. So let me fix an ordinal from here, uh, arbitrary vector and arbitrary functional. Uh, then, I, then I'm using that this equation one holds on DTS. Okay, so I just write it out. Then I'm just using that this is uh, the dual of TS is of course just S dual times T, T dual. Then I'm using that equation one holds for um, the operator T. So we obtain this. Then I will show that, then I will be using that equation one holds for the operator S. So we obtain this. And then we do the obvious thing. We use that this is just a dual. So we conclude at the end that the operator, the dual of, um, of T to TS is the same as the dual of uh, the product uh, theta t theta s. So therefore, you can forget about the, the the dualization and just have that this equality holds. So just uh, it it was absolutely crucial here that we did in this calculation. Um, this calculation was independent when we consider the alphas of of the functionals. Uh, uh, X and Psi, otherwise I could not have performed this. Otherwise I would have needed to apply this to, to functionals and would only have had the equation there. But then the alphas I am taking are depending on a club subset that's depending on these choices of X and Psi and you cannot conclude anything. This is why you needed to go through this hustle of taking intersections of, of countable intersections of club subsets. So, okay, now that I, I bored you with the multiplication linearity, I'm definitely not gonna go through that. That's the same, just easier. And again, at the end, you have a, a trivial bound basically uh, that you expect. You have that this algebra homomorphism is, is uh, contracted. Uh, what remains to show is that this guy is subjective. Uh, I will just rush through this. Uh, actually, what you do is don't, perhaps you don't want to show this barehandedly. Uh, you can actually show a little bit more. You can show that this map theta has a right inverse uh, capital uh, gamma, which maps from B of Y into B of XY, such that if you compose them the right way, you get the identity uh, operator on B of uh, Y. Um, okay, I have a few minutes. So how do you do this? Actually, uh, yeah, so how you do this is that you take an idempotent operator on, on uh, this Banach space, which does the following to a function G, it assigns the function minus the, the constant function with the value G at omega one. This is an item potent which will have range exactly C0 of zero, uh, zero omega one half open. And you can show that uh, if you consider this tensor product of operators, uh, P tensor E on identity on Y, and you restrict it to the Banach space XY, that this is actually just the identity operator on, on, on XY. Uh, so how you would like to define this map is the following way for a, for a fixed bounded linear operator in B of Y, you assign this, uh, you, you define this uh, tensor product and restrict it. This will be a legit uh, bounded linear operator on XY. Um, okay, that's, you can check that, not terribly interesting, but it's true. And therefore you can apply again, uh, the result of uh, Koshmider, Kanye, and Lawson, um, and extract a club subset defending on S, such that your this equation uh, that I wrote plenty of times before holds. Uh, and it turns out that if you try to check how your original operator A behaves, then uh, you have this obvious identity, 
for a fixed uh, X and Y and alpha from your club subset. So this is again, just using the fact that of course, if you, if you um, evaluate, uh, if you take the Dirac at alpha of, of uh, the characteristic function of, of this ordinary interval, then that will be just one. So this is a trivial identity, then this is the same as writing the uh, the projective tensor product of, of the idempotent uh, P with A and apply it to this vector. Um, now what you do is use this property that we extracted before. This was, remember, this was our operator S. So I just put it into the other side, dualize. And then I use what we had as equation one, what we did used already. And then I collapse again, these guys. So we end up with this. And again, dual by duality, this holds for all X and Psi. So we end up with actually what we wanted that uh, theta of S is exactly A. And you can see that this also, because of the fact that theta maps the identity on X, Y into the identity of Y, we actually have that we have a norm one uh, algebra homomorphism theta. And if we define then this capital lambda the obvious way, uh, then this will satisfy our required uh, identity. Uh, you can check that this is this is a linear map, but this is not this this lambda is not an algebra homomorphism. It's a linear map, but it's it's uh, not an algebra homomorphism. It's contractive, and again, because it maps the identity to the identity, it turns out that it's norm one. Uh, Sorry, what did I say? Yeah, yeah, the, it, it is an algebra homomorphism. I'm sorry. That's precisely because of the of the fact that P, how we defined it in the first term of the tensor product, we had a we had an item potent. So if you just keep your finger on the proof, then it turns out that this is this is an algebra isomorphism. I'm sorry. But what's lastly what we need that it's not injective, well, that's obvious if they were then we would have an isomorphism of these uh, algebras of operators. And then you would, uh, I don't know, do I use Idelheit's theorem, you would get that X, Y, and Y are isomorphic to each other as Banach spaces, but Y was uh, separable and X, Y is clearly not. It's a tensor product of, of a non-separable guy with Y, so it's non-separable and that's a contradiction. So we are done. Even I have trouble remembering what the statement of the theorem was. I think I was a bit too ambitious with this one, but thank you very much for your attention and for your patience. Here are some references. Thank you very much. <laughs>